Campaign 2020 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association, Quick Trip, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Realtors Association, and Wisconsin Operating Engineers Local 139. State Representative Lakeisha Myers of Milwaukee is a Democrat seeking re-election in the 12th Assembly District. Lakeisha, welcome back to Wisconsin Eye. Thank you for having me again. Always a pleasure. Thank you, ma'am. Um, the police reforming. Um, there's a, the Black Caucus has a plan. Senator Wangard has some bills. The Speaker's going to form a task force. The Governor has nine bills. Let's start by talking about that. Uh, before this session adjourns, what police reforms uh, would you absolutely want, must be passed, please? Well, absolutely. I think the uh, issue is that we've already adjourned. So I think that's one of the issues um, that is already at, at play. When you think about us having the special session, it's kind of a kick the can down the road uh, situation that we've been told is, is happening um, to a certain extent because we're not in traditional session. Um, when it comes to looking at the task force, um, it's not my favorite strategy at all. I think there were things that we could have done, um, you know, immediately when the Black Caucus called for a special session on in June on Juneteenth. Yeah. Um, there are simple things that are common sense that we could do: no knock warrants, chokeholds, um, you know, banning chokeholds, and having standardized uh, procedures for engaging with the public. I think those don't have to be discussed because they make sense. They make sense to officers. Uh, they make sense to the, the general public. Um, they've been championed nationally with the Justice and Policing Act through the Congressional Black Caucus. We've consistently said that as members of the state um, of the state Black Caucus, as well as um, you know, with general members saying that there needs to be um, you know some reforms there. I think this is something we've seen our neighbors do in Minnesota and Iowa, and Iowa has a Republican governor as well. So if Iowa was able to get something done that was a good first step, I think we should have been able to do the same thing. So hopefully we'll be able to do that. Do you have a fear? Uh, well, uh, Assembly Majority Leader Steinecke said he wants to have recommendations for the, for, for uh, ready for January when, when you do come back into session. But my question is, do you have a fear with so many different ideas out there, the police and Senator Wangard and the Black Caucus and the governor and whatever the task force comes up with, do you have a fear that nothing's gonna get done, ma'am? I don't have a fear that nothing will get done. Um, I think when you look at all the groups involved, I know in my um, conversation uh, with the executive director of the Wisconsin Professional Police Association, we were he, we were able to have conversations over the summer and they were able to publish um, a list of proposals. Quite frankly, some of them I, I agree with. There are maybe only a few that I don't um, that deal with rioters or, or you know protesters specifically. Um, and those are things that I think we can come to a consensus on, that there has to be something that changes because having someone shot in the back seven times is unconscionable. Um, having someone's, you know, an officer having their knee on the neck of George Floyd until he, you know, passed was something that's unconscionable. We are seeing continuously that engagements with communities, mainly communities of color, but not always, when you think of, um, you know, issues that have happened in the state of Wisconsin, they've not all been um, African Americans. There have been Hispanic individuals as well as white that have lost their lives to law enforcement. And I think there has to be some uniformity in how the public is engaged. Great. Thank you. New subject. How hard hit has the 12th Assembly District been hit by, by the pandemic, ma'am? I would say we've been hit. Uh, businesses, of course, we've uh, had businesses that had to close. We've had businesses that have had to change their mode of operation. Um, you know, a lot of our, we have a, a working population, then we have a large retirement population as well. So when it comes to my seniors, they've been hit tremendously hard. I have Luther Manor in my district and as well as Alexian Village as well, you know, and other skilled nursing care facilities. And COVID took a toll on a lot of my skilled care facilities. It was hard to find uh, employees to work. Um, there were, you know, things they had to do. They couldn't get PPE. So these are things that really hampered us in the 12th Assembly District. And that's something that um, I hope we really address in the next budget. I hope that the federal government comes in and steps up and does their part 
to help, um, you know, our skilled nursing care facilities as well as hospitals. Because, you know, for, quite frankly, CARES 2.0 only did $175 million to uh, providers, not to actual infrastructure, um, not to actual hospitals or to any skilled care facilities to help them maintain or even go beyond what they were doing for COVID. So I've had providers call me, you know, Alexia and Village Luther Manor saying, we're trying to negotiate how to buy PPE and we're buying them at cost. There's no discount. Um, there was no, in, you know, the Defense Production Act has not worked. It has not been invoked enough to make sure that we have adequate ventilators or PPE or thermometers, you know, quite frankly, to monitor people's uh, temperatures and things of that nature. Um, well, um, if the pandemic means we don't collect as much in tax collections in the current fiscal year, let's say I'm gonna make up a number. If we don't collect the billion that we expected, um, would you uh, go towards raising taxes and fees or cutting spending? I think there has to be a combination of both, but I think we're on the proper traje trajectory um, to not have to do that, even in light of COVID. I looked at the most recent uh, Fiscal Bureau report that Bob Lang published, and he said that we're at a 1.1% increase. Right now, we don't have to have a budget repair bill. So I think we're pretty much in, in good shape. Hopefully that will uh, remain constant. I'm looking forward to the October report and hopefully we are, we are constant in that and we don't have to go back and do anything different. Okay, the, um, the governor's statewide mask edict expires on September 28th. Uh, do you think it should be extended for public safety reasons? Absolutely. Um, I'm a stickler for wearing a mask when you are out in public and in closed spaces. I think that was the right call on the governor's uh, part. I think he did the right thing, especially in light of what we see now that Donald Trump knew, you know, and when he knew that, um, and that how many lives could have been saved, you know, 36,000 lives at least could have been saved by doing something at the federal level. So I think that in one way, you know, Tony Evers is being vindicated for being, uh, you know, proactive instead of reactive and not listening to the naysayers, but listening to science. I think he saved lives in, in that aspect. So I think when you look at that, you know, I think a lot of my Republican colleagues were being reactionary and, you know, were, you know, fighting based on emotion, saying, no, we're going to come back in and overturn a mask mandate uh, that, you know, Scott Fitzgerald wanted to do. Didn't want to come back for anything else. But when the governor said wear a mask, then he was up in arms because that assaulted his feelings. Uh, so, you know, his sensibility. So I think that this is something that we have to look at it and use common sense. I mean, you know, this is not uh, something that we can play with. I think when you look at the number of people that have died from COVID-19, um, we can't afford to, to, to continue on this path of playing with, I want to wear a mask, I don't want to wear a mask. There should be no question that the mask mandate should be extended. Well, um, when you think about hospitals on the front line of caring for COVID-19 patients, if you're reelected voting on the next state budget, should, should hospitals be an even greater priority than maybe they are in the current budget? They should. And I think one of the first things we should do is accept the Medicaid expansion because that would no, uh, most definitely help our rural hospitals as well as our urban ones. Um, like I said before, the hospitals have not received a dime, really. Um, providers received something, but it has not been anything from the uh, federal government to supplement that. But we also need to do what we need to do at the state level to uh, make sure that we have consistency across the board. I don't see COVID going anywhere anytime soon. I think that, you know, with the fall and winter coming, this flu season on top of COVID, you know, you will have a lot more people being harmed by this and being um, subject to COVID-19. And we may have to go through another shutdown or anything. We don't know what the future will hold. So we need to make sure that we protect our infrastructure at our hospitals to make sure they have the advanced technology they need um, and that people don't have to drive so far away or have you to one of our research hospitals in the state. I think, you know, local hospitals should be given what they need to handle this pandemic. State Senator Kappinger last week introduced a bill. It says, if your business or organization follows the COVID protocols to protect your patients, customers, or employees, you couldn't be sued because of COVID. Uh, do we need this law? I think it's interesting uh, when I when I read that. I, th I think it's something that we do need when you look at, there's no way to really, um, oh, sorry. Oh, there was a buzz there. Yep, excuse me. Um, I, I think that there's something that needs to happen because we can only go on the employee, on the employer's word. 
that they were able to wipe down certain things or they were able to, you know, do the proper cleaning and all of these things. So there's no way to track when that was done, how it was done, who did it. Um, you know, so with that, with so many uncertainties, I wouldn't, I would think so. Okay. Um, as a Democrat, do you support the governor's proposal for a People's Maps Commission to draw the next congressional and legislative lines? Because as you know, the Constitution said this says the party in power will draw those lines. It does. Um, I, I understand what the state constitution says, and I also understand uh, what the governor um, has proposed as well. And I'm, I'm happy uh, with the composition of the People's Map Commission. I think the outline of the Maps Commission was done in an equitable fashion. I think that the individuals who are there, um, you know, fall along the lines uh, on, of both parties being represented equally. I think there are people there that will be able to do the job and be actively involved in the process of their government. So I appreciate that aspect of it. Um, hopefully that their recommendations will be followed by the legislature. Um, because I think when you look at 54 out of uh, 72 counties having uh, referendums or questions, uh, resolutions saying, you know, do you want to have better maps? Republicans and Democrats both said, yes, we require better maps. So what better way to do that than have this People's Map Commission and actually listen to the people and have them choose their representation and not the other way around. I think that's more important when you look at how maps were drawn the last time around, when you see whole neighborhoods that were, you know, taken out of districts or, you know, the way if you look at a map and you see my district, I have a small portion of Wauwatosa, you know, it goes in and out on certain neighborhoods. Jason Fields and I laugh about this all the time because people will say, well, why can't I have one of your yard signs? And I have to tell them, I'm not your state representative. He is. He said, but I'm right across the street from my neighbor. I know it makes no sense. So, you know, these things are, you know, it's sad when you look at this of how these lines were drawn to determine representation of people. And I think it's something that's restrictive as well as uh, for representatives of color because we are restricted pretty much based on how the lines are drawn with representation being concentrated solely in Milwaukee. As, as more states around Wisconsin legalize recreational and medical marijuana, what's, what's your position? My position is that we need to, we can no longer afford to be an island among ourselves. Uh, quite frankly, I think we need, we are missing opportunities. That's what I really feel. We are missing a lot of opportunities when it comes to looking at how to grow business, how to expand business. We should be on the front end of that being the dairy state, being, you know, vast lands of agriculture, you know, having people have the opportunity to work in urban agriculture. These are green jobs, literally, they are. Um, I think these are some of the green jobs that we could have for the future when it comes to testing for medicinal purposes. I think that we should be decriminalizing uh, marijuana as far as um, happens in, across the state and not just in municipalities. I think there are some things that we could do there as well, um, but I'm all for uh, legalization, um, medicinal and recreational. Thank you. Uh, property taxes in Wisconsin are high, which is why schools and local governments have been dealing with caps and limits on their property taxes for more than 20 years. If you're reelected voting on the next state budget, would you continue those caps and limits on uh, property tax levies? Oh my goodness. I think this is a big issue. <laughs> when you look at um, our property tax levels, I think number one, we have to find a real solution to school funding that is not uh, as laborious as it is for, ta for taxpayers, for property owners, um, because we can't continue going back to the same source and asking for more and more and more. I think the state has to find a legitimate way to operate its schools. Um, I think we talked about this before, that we are operating basically three school districts in one, and we have one pot of money. We can't continue to operate that way, and everything can't be solely based on the property tax index. So that's the first thing. The next issue is I don't think we, um, we have to do more to grow our economy across the state and make sure that we have um, partnerships between urban and rural communities when it comes to our dairy industry, um, expanding jobs that they have there. When I'm on the agriculture committee, I'm told by you know my rural counterparts that we need people to work. And I say, I have plenty of people in my district that want to work. How are we gonna get the products to them to have them be able to work on, you know, to work? They can't come to the farm, but if you can get the products to them and have manufacturing and, and processing happening in the urban centers, that's a partnership that we can use to expand what it is that we, um, that we produce in Wisconsin. So I think there's a twofold system that, that's working there. 
Do cities, villages, and towns need more revenue options? Remember that Representative Goyke has the bill that uh, uh, if you pass a referendum, uh, Milwaukee County could levy an additional half cent sales tax. Do local government, do you support that bill and do, do. local governments need more uh, revenue options? I think they do need more revenue options, especially when you look at how historically my community has been treated in the shared revenue experience that is Wisconsin. Um, you know, not only looking out for larger municipalities like Milwaukee, but I think you have to, we, we're, we're always going to be left footing the bill for smaller communities. But I think we have a twofold responsibility. Number one, finding and expanding uh, uh, job opportunities and business opportunities in smaller com communities, as well as expanding what we have already and allowing local municipalities to raise their limits. We, we want a you know, five cent increase in Milwaukee. That shouldn't be that difficult to do. Um, considering the state legislature, you know, this last budget increased uh, DMV fees by, you know, X amount of dollars and added on, you know, the county uh, a few years back added a $30 wheel tax um, in Milwaukee County. So I think these are things that we are dealing with um, that, you know, we, we can't continue to operate in this way. Um, the and government, of course, I, I love the gas tax index too. So I, I, I think we need that. Well, do you want to do you want to just in, in index a gas tax, or do you want to raise it a few pennies and index it? Raise it a few pennies and index. I think we have to make up for lost time. Um, when we lost the gas tax index that worked for us well for thirty years, we need to reinstate that. But we also need to adjust for inflation when it comes to raising uh, by a few pennies. Okay, uh, if a school district or a, a local government w plans a major public works project. Should they have to give a preference to Wisconsin businesses, Representative? Absolutely. I think that goes without saying. You want to make sure that they are Wisconsin businesses and hopefully they'll be unionized businesses. Um, you know, if that, if that were really being serious, I think people should have a living wage and uh, we should look at Wisconsin businesses first. And I'm also um, vehement about making sure that minority contractors have the opportunity to be at the table for those opportunities as well. And then final question, differences between you and your opponent on November 3? Differences between myself and my opponent were, are, um, number one, he's my neighbor, <laughs> like almost literally across the street. So that's interesting. Uh, but I find it highly interesting that um, I was living out of state. I lived out of state for eight years. And on my visits back, I would come home and say, what is happening to my neighborhood? And I said, this can't continue to go on. So I purposely made sure that I returned to Wisconsin and, you know, re-engaged with the community, found out what was going on, became active in the community, and, and decided to run for office. And the people elected me to this position. Um, my opponent was living in the district all that time while the decline was happening. Um, they did not choose to run uh, when my uh, predecessor was in office, and he was in office for 14 years. Um, so I find it highly interesting that I've been on the job roughly about 18, 19 months and now I have a challenger. So I think that's something that's different right now. Um, but I also want to say that I think a key difference between the two of us is that I have a very good grasp of the issues as well as what the responsibility and the role is for the state legislature. A lot of times I hear my opponent talk about issues that are primarily municipal responsibilities. So therefore, I don't think he has a really good grasp of what is happening at the state level and how we are very different from the municipal level. Um, so that's another key difference. Um, but ultimately, the, the, it's in the voters' hands. So I will do the will of the people. State, Repres State Representative Lakeisha Myers of Milwaukee is a Democrat seeking re-election in the 12th Assembly District. Representative, thank you for your time. Thanks for talking to Wisconsin Eye. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, ma'am. Have a good day. All right. Campaign 2020 is sponsored by... Wisconsin Hospital Association, Quick Trip, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Realtors Association, and Wisconsin Operating Engineers Local 139.